Okay, I think um, we'll get going this morning so that we don't run out of time. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Think Green, Solutions for Vulnerable Areas. My name is Molly Brown, and I'm going to be your behind-the-scenes host today. Before we get started with the presentation, I would just to like to go over a few housekeeping um, things with you today. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that the session is being recorded and it will be shared. All of you as attendees are muted by the host. To indicate if you would like to speak, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand button uh, option in the participants window or use the chat box. Uh, there are a couple of us who are going to be monitoring the chat box for your questions. And I know that Juliana wants it to be an interactive presentation. So please don't hesitate to raise your questions as they come up. Uh, please go ahead and update your name with your pronoun and organization if you haven't already done so. In order to do that, take your mouse and hover over your image. You'll see your three dots at the upper right hand corner and you can choose that and select rename. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is that if you are having any technical issues, please go ahead and message me and or Laura Knoll uh, in the chat box and we will try to help you out with them. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Juliana Greenberg. Thanks, Molly. Hi, everyone. I'm Juliana Greenberg. I'm an environmental management staffer working with the Chesapeake Bay Program's Habitat Goal Implementation Team. My work normally focuses on issues of fish habitat and passage, as well as stream health, but today I'm going to talk to you about green infrastructure. So we can go on to the next slide. And before we dive in, I actually want to take a minute to gauge everyone's level of knowledge about green infrastructure. So as soon as you're ready, Laura, yep, a poll should be popping up right now on your screen asking you what your level of knowledge of green infrastructure is. And so that ranges from I've never heard of it before to I work with it as a part of my job. Go ahead and answer that poll if you haven't already. And I'll give you all just a couple more seconds to get that done. Um, and then we'll take a look. I wanna make sure that we're all kind of in the same page. And if not, that I can take some time to explain it. All right, looks like we're getting some great responses already. And I think actually everyone's about responded. So we can go ahead and end polling. And it looks like, awesome. It looks like we've got um, a pretty good spread of people's level of knowledge. I am going to take some time to explain green infrastructure and what that means and what I'm talking about. So we can move on to the next slide. So even though a lot of us know what green infrastructure is or work with it as a part of our job, I think that term can mean a lot of different things to different people. So I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about what I am talking about when I say green infrastructure. And I really like this quote that American Rivers gives. I think it really frames the idea well and encompasses a lot of what I'm trying to get down to today. It says, green infrastructure is an approach to water management that protects, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. Green infrastructure is effective, economical, and enhances community safety and quality of life. Now, I love this quote because it really tells you what green infrastructure is and why it's important in just two sentences which is something I am about to take the next several slides to do. So with that, we can move on to the next slide and we can start talking about examples. So from our previous quote, we know that green infrastructure can protect, restore, and mimic the natural water cycle, but that can include a lot of different projects on a lot of different scales. One classic example that many of you may have already heard of is a rain garden. We have an image of a rain garden here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Rain gardens are depressed areas in the landscape that collect all the water flowing from impervious areas around it. You can see there's some parking lots on either side of our little garden here, as well as a road in the background. And it retains the water from um, a storm event and holds it until after that peak flow from the storm. By holding the water until after that peak flow and letting it slowly integrate back into the ground, rain gardens can reduce localized flooding. They can also allow for some natural water filtration because rather than having that water just flow directly back into whatever the closest body of water is or the closest storm drain, by having that rain water flowing through the ground, the, there is a little bit of natural filtering going on through the dirt and through the different plants that are there. So let's go on to the next slide and talk about another example. Right here we have permeable pavement. 
And this image, I think, shows uh, a type of green infrastructure that you've probably seen without even really noticing before. Between the tiles here, we can see there are unfilled gaps, which allow any water that flows over the pavement to re-enter the ground really close to where it originally made contact. Now, this means that the water doesn't really have to flow as far so in order to enter the ground again. So it doesn't carry as many pollutants or pick up trash and stuff. You can kind of see in the rain garden, there are bits of trash, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is one benefit of permeable pavements. It also has a similar um, localized flood reduction when it's used on a wide scale um, as other green infrastructure projects do. Though permeable pavement often has a far more localized impact than something like a rain garden. And then I have one more example of green infrastructure that I want to give today on our next slide, please. And that is wetland restoration. Now, many of you who are familiar with wetland restoration and green infrastructure might not necessarily think of wetland restoration as a form of green infrastructure. And that might be because it usually requires a lot more area or it's less often to occur in an urban setting like you'd think of for a rain garden or permeable pavement. But really it hits all of those big points that we talked about as being necessary for green infrastructure in our American rivers quote. Restoring a wetland can also provide new or improved habitat for many species. It can act as a natural filtration system and it really does help retain that water and reconnect the landscape to the natural water table which is what we're really trying to get at when we're looking at green infrastructure. Now on the next slide, my last slide giving us a little bit of a basis, I wanna talk about why green infrastructure. And we've already talked a little bit about the environmental benefits. That's that flood reduction or the pollutant reduction. There's also benefits of um, things like urban tree canopy could reduce the urban heat island effect that we so often hear talk about when we're talking about climate change. There's also treating stormwater at its source. I talked about a little bit with that natural filtration in wetlands and rain gardens. So I wanna to touch a little bit more on how green infrastructure can be cost effective and the social benefits that it can bring. One of the big critiques of green infrastructure and the reasons that people don't wanna use it as opposed to more traditional gray infrastructure is that it's so expensive. But that people usually believe that because they're not taking into account the ecosystem services that green infrastructure can provide. So that is those things, those environmental benefits, the flood reduction, the reduction in the urban heat island effect. When we take into account these services that are so often not listed in the market value of a product, we see that we're getting a lot more bang for our buck. A lot of the gray infrastructure solutions that we think of as cheaper actually make these environmental issues that do affect our day-to-day -day life harder to deal with and will be more expensive in the long run to treat as opposed to using green infrastructure, which as a side effect actually helps with those. Then lastly, social benefits. Um, one of the easiest to see benefits of green infrastructure is that it's often more attractive than gray infrastructure. And people do like to live in an area that they think is pretty. So that's actually a really big social benefit of going green versus gray. There is also the ability to um, bring new jobs to an area through green infrastructure, um, construction and management. We have several different green jobs programs across the watershed and give, going for a green infrastructure solution over a gray infrastructure really um, allows these jobs to thrive and build a bigger market for them uh, throughout our communities. And now at this point, I do want to stop for questions because I know it was a pretty quick primer on green infrastructure. Is there anything that I can answer in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself before we move on? All right, awesome. Then I'm going to just keep going. So we can go on to the next slide here. Thank you. And now we're gonna get into the project that I am actually really here to talk about today. It's called Targeted Outreach for Green Infrastructure in Vulnerable Areas. And I'm gonna call it TOBI for short because that is a really long project name as I'm sure we can all guess. Um, so TOGI is an EPA funded project through the Chesapeake Bay Program's Goal Implementation Team Funding Mechanism. So if you know what that is, then you know what that means. But if you don't, that's fine. It's just a program funded by the Chesapeake Bay Program. 
The goal of TOGI is to identify three underserved communities that are at high risk due to climate change and have habitat of conservation or restoration value. Once these communities are identified, we're going to work with our contractor, Skio Solutions, to hold local listening sessions and workshops to develop a green infrastructure design that is tailored specifically to the concerns identified by community members. Our project doesn't extend to implementation, unfortunately, um, but it does come up with a design that the community can go forth and implement themselves. And we do plan to work with the selected towns to identify sources of funding that are available for the implementation of their project. We're planning to work with one community each in Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and have assembled a, team, a steering committee of experts in a variety of fields that can help us key in on which communities would get the biggest impact from working with us on this project. We have members on our steering committee who are experts in climate change, who are experts in diversity and equity, habitat, GIS, and as well as people who have specific connections to communities in each of these states who can help us learn more about the social and political factors that can be so hard to really understand when you're just Googling online. And we used all of this great expertise to come up with a list of criteria that the entire group thought would be most useful and most important in a community that we would target. So let's go into our next slide. Perfect. And so that criteria that we came up with from our list, we decided to divide it up into tier one and tier two categories. So our tier one categories would be criteria and indicators that we thought would really be important to know if a community would be a good fit for our project. And tier two would be more of helping us decide what kind of project would be a good fit once we had identified those communities. So for after we'd come up with that list, we looked across the watershed at the different maps of each of our tier one indicators. And I apologize for not including a legend, but we can see on the right hand of our slide here is actually a map of Montrose, Virginia, viewed through one of our indicators, which is the terrestrial habitat core and connectors data set from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. What you should be seeing here is a bunch of purple blobs with a little bit of green lines connecting them. And those purple blobs are habitat cores. This is where there's a high concentration of valuable habitat for critical species identified by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we really saw when we were looking at this is that Montrose is surrounded on all sides by these important habitat cores. We thought this was really interesting and combined with scoring highly in some of the other maps that we looked at, we ended up selecting Montrose as one of the communities that we would be looking at and continuing um, to move past our initial screening as we are looking at all of the GIS layers across the watershed. So from there at that initial screening, we were able to narrow down the entire watershed to just nine communities, three in each state, three in Maryland, three in Virginia, and three in Pennsylvania. Once we had that initial screening done, we looked more at our tier two indicators. And we used those in addition to deciding what would be a good project, we kind of used it for, well, once we know that all of these would be good sites, which would be the best site? We looked at that along with different social and political factors in the communities to figure out what would be the biggest bang for our buck and where we could really make an impact and help the community. So let's go on to the next slide. And I want you all to think for a second what is one criteria that you would consider when selecting a site for a green infrastructure project? So think about that and type it in the chat, but don't hit enter. I want you all to think about any of the green infrastructure that we talked about today, any that you might work with or that you've heard of, or just what you think that we should do in this situation. So take a second and type that into the chat, and then we're going to hit enter all at the same time, and we'll have a waterfall of answers going down the chat. So make sure you select that you're entering it to everyone so that we can all see the different answers that we're getting. So I'll give you all just a couple more seconds. So let's do five, four, three, two, one, enter. Awesome, we are getting some great stuff. I'm seeing sea level rise, air quality, coll uh, collection area pollution, flooding, soil, stormwater management, ease of maintenance, hydrology, impervious surfaces. These are all really great areas. And now I do also see a couple of questions and I'm not sure if there are questions for me or uh, 
one of the criteria you'd be using, which is buy-in and who will directly benefit. So understanding those two things is critical for our project and for any of the similar projects. But I'm gonna focus in on, oh yeah, two small culverts near a bridge that's being washed out. These are really great. Uh, I love all of these. And some of them we did use in our project and some of them we did not. I'm gonna go on to the next slide now and we can talk about which criteria we did end up using. So you can see here on the left, we have our tier one layers, which as I said, were the layers that we used when we looked at the whole map of the watershed to determine what looked like a good place for us to key in some more of our focus. And we've got some climate change layers as well as diversity and habitat layers. For climate change, we have sea level rise and flood hazard. And I saw that sea level rise was in the chat. So you were thinking along the same lines as us, but obviously that's not applicable to all of the communities in Maryland, Virginia and Pennsylvania, right? Because not everyone is on the shore. So what we really did there was we weighted flood hazard a little bit more heavily than sea level rise so that we could take in those communities that also are experiencing inland flooding whether it be from poor stormwater infrastructure or the banks of a river flooding, it really opened us up to a lot of different communities that sea level rise alone would not have captured. Then when we were looking at trying to identify which communities would be underserved to identify that part of our project to address it, sorry, we looked at the 2019 percent low income and percent minority um, by census block as uh, from the EPA's environmental justice screening pool. And we chose those two because historically low-income communities and communities of color have been systematically excluded from environmentalism and from especially the conservation narrative. So very actively making a choice to take these communities into account ensured that we would not let our own biases guide us. And it really, um, it really addressed the underserved aspect of this project's narrative. And then finally, we can see our last two tier one layers, are, or our last three, sorry, are the aquatic core habitat networks, as well as the terrestrial and wetland core connector networks and the US Fish and Wildlife Services National Wetlands Inventory. And we used these three so that we could really capture the habitat everywhere. We wanted to make sure that we weren't just focusing on terrestrial habitat or aquatic habitat. We do have a little bit of redundancy with wetlands, but we decided that that was okay because wetland habitat is really important and we want to protect that even more so than a lot of other habitat types in the watershed. Then we have a couple of tier two layers which are largely focused on habitat and climate change issues. So we're going to go on to our next slide and I'm going to ask you to put yourself into our shoes again. In the chat, I'm going to provide the data that we actually use to make our community selection. So this tier one and tier two data, and I'm going to have you and one or two partners take the opportunity to look at that data and decide what community you would prioritize working with. You're only gonna get 10 minutes to look over this and we took several months. So just come to whatever conclusion feels right when you're looking at the data and don't worry too much about monitoring, mirroring our process exactly. So if you're in a group that is an even number, you're going to look at the data for Maryland. And if you're in a group that's an odd number, you're going to look at the data for Virginia. And then after 10 minutes, we're going to come back together and discuss which community you chose. So be prepared to report out on your community selection and what your rationale was. I'm going to ask for volunteers, but if we don't get any, I'm just gonna go through the list on column people. So be prepared to tell us what you were thinking. All right, and so I see that Molly has put in the chat, which would you choose? And then if you are a Maryland, if you're an even group, go to Maryland, odd group, go to Virginia. So pay attention to your group number. Awesome, it looks like almost everyone is coming back from their breakout rooms, which is great. So as everyone is coming back, I am going to ask you to think about if you'd be willing to volunteer to report out from what your group talked about. And if you are, if you could just raise your hand and I will go ahead and call on someone. Any volunteers? If nobody volunteers, I'm just going to call on you, so. Okay, awesome. Phoebe, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, no problem. Um, so I was in an odd group and so we looked at Virginia and we collectively decided that West Point out of the three sites that we were given would be the best location for green infrastructure, mostly mm -hmm. based on, we looked at the flood maps um, and as well as what would happen as um, sea level rise increased and found that that site would probably be the one most affected as well as we looked at um, the demographics of the area and found that that area also had um, um, indigenous population reserves in the area and thought that that was a significant um, place to target. So that was kind of the basis of a lot of our discussion. Awesome. Does anyone have a, a, a different community in Virginia that they selected or does anyone want to build off of what Phoebe said in support? Okay, Maura. Uh, we picked Farnham for mm -hmm. our Virginia site. Um, so similar to um, the other site, it, it does have the higher percentage of low income population. Um, but on the habitat side of things, it was designated as a black duck um, habitat area of interest. Um, it had a pretty good aquatic habitat connection, especially when we compared it to the York River or West Point. Um, and the big one for us was that Farnham um, compared to West Point, um, Farnham was not projected to experience major marsh migration, whereas West Point was. So our concern was if we put something in at West Point um, with how much the river was protected to change, that project might not um, like stay in place or um, be functioning properly long-term. Yeah, that's definitely really important to consider and something that I know our group did take into account. Did anyone want to support Mora or Phoebe or give our last community a little bit of a shout out for Virginia? All right, I'm not seeing anyone, so I'll, I'll let it slide. But anyone who got within an even group and did Maryland, do we have any volunteers for that? Anyone want to support Princess Anne? Our group um, supported Princess Anne. Awesome. Cool. So, Can you tell us? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we noticed that it was located kind of at the headwaters of a pretty big stream feeding into like a larger tributary. So we thought that made it pretty important in terms of its location. And then we saw that it had really high percentages of low income and minority residents, um, lots of protected marshes surrounding the area, um, a lot of high connectivity, and it seemed to be at a pretty significant flood hazard risk. Yeah. Yeah, those are all really great things to pick up on. Does anyone want to support Chloe or maybe Federalsburg or Cambridge? All right, Susan, do you mind telling us why you supported Federalsburg? Uh, Federalsburg stood out to us as having um, the most chance to go from dry to wet in the town mm -hmm. in the um, decades to come. So it was at a higher risk. The other two towns we looked at um, did not have that risk. Um, this is the only one that mentioned a, a bird migration in the mm -hmm. area. And it was also uh, designated a high priority black duck project. Yeah. And um, what I guess at the top of the list was the sea level rise problem. So we chose Pebblesburg. Uh, um, the population was all sort of even in those three towns of my, you know, minorities and low income people. Right. All right, and then before, for our last comment, is anyone willing to support Cambridge before we move on? Before I reveal the results of what our project ended up selecting. All right, I'll just give you a couple more seconds for someone to come forward. I don't know who was in which group, so I can't call on you that easily, but all right. Seeing nobody, Laura, could you pull back up the slides? Thank you. And then we can go on to the next slide. 
and I will, the big reveal of which community we chose in Virginia. So we ended up, our group selected West Point. And there were three big reasons why we chose West Point over the other communities in Virginia. The thing to keep in mind here is that at this point, all three communities in both states would have been great locations for a great infrastructure project. And we were all, all of the steering committee agreed on that. So the three things that made West Point stand up, stand out above Montrose or Farnham was one, the potential for it to be located in a NOAA habitat focus area. The Middle Peninsula of Virginia is currently being considered for a habitat focus area by NOAA, which could bring a lot of resources to the area for that green infrastructure implementation. As I mentioned before, we don't have the resources available to us to implement these projects. So taking into account where they would be able to get that money was something we really wanted to make sure we were doing as we were selecting our communities. The second big reason was that there were well-documented environmental concerns already when we were doing our research. And that wasn't mentioned in the maps because it actually occurred after we had looked at the maps that we did this additional research. But we found out that West Point has started their own green infrastructure plan for the town already and is in the process of addressing some of those environmental concerns. We thought this was a really great opportunity for us to go in and kind of help that process and add our resources to facilitate what they had already started and really make sure that we could help build what West Point had started to reflect what the community, uh, what the community members needed. And the third big uh, point for why we selected West Point was the presence of the Mattaponi and Pamunkey tribes in the area. As Phoebe mentioned, I believe, the presence of these indigenous populations we thought was a really important thing for us to take into account. Historically, as I'm sure many of us know, um, the indigenous people in the United States have been a group that has been actively excluded from conversations about land use and environmentalism, despite having a very vested interest in it. Um, and so we wanted to take the opportunity to ensure that the tribe's concerns about environmental issues in the area are being listened to and heard by the town as they're developing a green infrastructure plan and kind of make sure all of these different groups we're hearing each other and having a really open discussion through our round tables. And then, so let's go on to the next slide and we can talk about Maryland. So despite none of you being willing to stand up for Cambridge, that was actually the community that our steering committee did select to target in Maryland. So the three big reasons here are, so first it's that the Chonk Tank watershed is currently a NOAA habitat focus area. And so similarly to the reason for West Point, we thought that Cambridge being within this focus area already would open them up to new grants that they could apply for. It could open up more funding and resources in different ways that could get this implementation on the ground. Second was the existing partnerships that already exist in Cambridge, like Envision the Chop Tank. Is, um, that's a group that a lot of our members on our steering committee were actually a part of. And so we know that there's work being done in Cambridge that we can build off of, and that will be beneficial to um, lend our hand and our ear to. And then the third big reason was specific environmental issues have been documented in low-income communities in Cambridge. One of the big things we always hear about is sea level rise when we're talking about Cambridge, but that actually is mostly occurring in wealthier areas. We want to make sure that we are addressing the more low-income and higher communities of uh, higher minority areas in Cambridge, which tends to be farther inland away from the shore, and they are facing different environmental risks. It's actually more of a risk of um, inland flooding due to poor stormwater infrastructure and uh, riverbank flooding. So we wanted to make sure we were paying attention to that. And I'm gonna end really quickly, sorry to rush through this, but I wanted to have an opportunity for people to ask questions, uh, even if it's just really quick before we, before we end our presentation today. So thank you all, and please raise your hand or put a question in the chat if there's anything that I can answer. All right, well, um, seeing, oh, we'll be able to view the story maps after today. Yes, these story maps, the link is available to the public. And so um, I can send them out as an email to all of the participants 
so that you all can have access to them. Awesome, thank you, Tim. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any other questions today. Oh, how can I become more involved in the outreach and community engagement with these communities? So um, I think the best way would be to email me. And you can see my email is on the screen. It is greenbergj at chesapeake.org. This should be, a, I believe this recording will be available afterwards. Oh, thank you, Laura, for popping that in the chat. And I will be happy to do any follow-up work with you um, as we're doing our outreach. All right. Well, thank you all. And please don't hesitate to send me an email or reach out to me after the presentation. I really appreciate it.